want to take this opportunity to um, introduce our keynote speaker. And this is going to be a little bit different format. Um, Steve Betcher, who I'll, uh, I'll introduce more formally in a second, um, is going to talk with us for a few minutes. But then we're going to do a little bit of an interview kind of concept in true Welsh Tech style. I'll do the interview and ask Steve the hard-hitting questions. Uh, but some of those questions we'd like to come from you. So uh, there are a couple ways to do that. And I'll be monitoring these, these channels. So be thinking about your questions as he's talking or as we're talking. If you go into the mobile app and you find uh, his session, his keynote session, at the bottom there is, an, there is a survey. And uh, it's simple one question. What question do you want to ask Steve? Type it in there. I'll see it on my computer. And uh, if, uh, if it hasn't been asked before and, and relevant, uh, we'll ask Steve and we'll let him answer your question. Also, if you want to put something up on Twitter in the form of a question with hashtag WellsTechConf, I'll be checking that as well as Steve and I chit chat. So we'd like most of the questions to come from you, make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so please take advantage of that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Betcher, five-time Emmy Award-winning um, producer, the man behind uh, Wells Connection, uh, the man behind The Road to Emmaus, uh, the man behind Come Follow Me. He doesn't do it all by himself, but uh, he has a lot to do with it. Uh, so a lot of PBS specials, I'm sure he can tell you more. Just go to IMDB and you'll actually find Steve. You know you've made it in his world uh, if you can find yourself on IMDB. So without further ado, please welcome Steve Vetcher. Good evening. How's everyone? Um, Martin, I got to move your crap out of the way here. All right. Sorry about that. All right. Thank you very much. It's a distinct honor to be here tonight with you guys. Thank you very much. Um, from the let's just uh, get a few things straight. First off, I am not a public speaker. I'm not gifted as a public speaker. Please set your expectations very low this evening, OK? If it goes bad, I'm out of here. Honestly, I'm on the next Greyhound bus. I'm out of town. Um, but. Since college, I have made my living as a television and media producer. It's pretty much all I know. This is the craft that I um, have tried to perfect. If it wasn't for this craft, I'd be completely unemployed. I would be at the drive-up window at McDonald's supersizing your order tomorrow morning. That would be me. Nearly every media outlet you can think of, PBS, NBC, CBS, the UK, great deal of time creating television and media around the world. I have the privilege of interviewing world leaders, CEOs, I've met four presidents, athletes, entertainers, over the Olympics, Super Bowls, World Series, fighting in the Gaza Strip, migrant worker. In addition to that, I've had the privilege and honor to uh, work closely and produce the Wells Connection for the last 28 years, Kids Connection for 20 years, um, to be honest, I, I think I've learned more about my Cine than I ever really wanted to know from the beginning. So um, I really wasn't that curious. Um, what's attracted to me, what's attracted me to this profession is the incredible power of this tool. When it's done well, to me, it's amazing. It's visually amazing and striking, and it's like poetry to me. move someone's heart, to me it's magical. Now, I guess a little foundation, if you will, about me. I am a eternal optimist. I feel bad for the pessimist who leads kind of that challenged life, if you will. I want to work on what's right, figure out, not, not figure out what's wrong. I want to look for virtue, not fault. You know the pessimist will look out the window tonight and watch the sunset and only see the specks in the glass. And tonight, that pessimist will come up to me and say, Betcher, I got five things wrong with your speech. He really only needs one. Um, so tonight, those are kind of the rules um, for the presentation. I want to be very optimistic to about our chat with Martin. 
I'll sit up here for a minutes, few minutes talking about the media, the challenges of the media, and Martin and I will talk about um, an interactive discussion about ministry and the way to incorporate it in churches. Okay, is this becoming more annoying or is this like working for you guys? Can you hear me? It's okay? Okay, Martin, good? All right. Along the way in this profession, I've been, toward me? Along the way in this profession, I've been totally intrigued by the challenge of putting into words impact of the media and its content. This is a powerful tool, has the ability to shape perspective. Right now, 
Um, please don't look too closely at my family. It's easier to get up here and talk about this stuff than it is actually to do it. It's much easier. But it's something we all are working on. We're working on in our household just as much as you are too. Um, I remind my kids of a model of YouTube. You know the slogan of YouTube? Broadcast yourself. Guess what, kids? Yourself might not be that important. And Facebook, yourself again, might not be the greatest subject to focus so much time on. You're really not that interested in that, kids. And my kids look at me when I tell them that. Uh, now we want to feel like we're important. I understand it. I know in human nature we want to feel like we're very important, but do we really care about others first? That these media tools should be an enhancer for our relationships, not a replacement. Okay, all this technology is brand new, right? We're figuring this all out. Facebook, what, 10 years old? A lot of these social media, all brand new to us. Or is it that new? Um, in 1844, a milestone of human communication started in 1844. This is the beginning of the interaction part of the evening. 1844, human communication, brand new milestone. You know what it is? Telegraph, awesome. 1844, milestone, the telegraph. The first time you could virtually communicate. And you could finally go quicker with communication than a man on horseback could travel with a message. The first few weeks, great tool used for talking about weather, about politics, about important issues of the day back and forth between telegraph operators. The bosses soon learned everybody was starting to chat, talking about their spouses, talking about their neighborhoods, talking about their friends. They were even playing checkers. The third week of the telegraph machine, they were playing checkers. <laughs> Swear, two story. And uh, they were swapping recipes, and it became the first waste of time in technology. <laughs> the bosses quickly stepped in and tried to halt it. There was a hard time stopping it. There was a book that came out in 1890 called Wired Love, 1890. It's a story about two telegraph operators, a man on the west coast, a woman on the east coast, they met in St. Louis, they fell in love first by the telegraph machine, and they decided to meet face to face for the first time, met at a boarding house in St. Louis. All their, car all their conversations were awkward, stilted, they couldn't communicate. They went back to their boarding rooms, they thought about it the next morning, they met again, it still was awkward. The third day, the telegraph operator decided, what the guy decided to string a room, a cord from his room to his friend's room, and they communicated all day and all night in the boarding house via the telegraph machine. And he did propose to her the fourth day via Morse code. <laughs> so, wire love. Milton, uh, Martin Selling in the back of the room, 1895, in the back of the room. Okay, um, okay so uh, another great example of this is um, a few years later, another disaster, if you will, happened a few years later, 1912, the Titanic. It left um, Southampton, you guys know the story, it left Southampton, um, it now was wireless telegraph, it was on the ship. It left Southampton, was at sea for four days. The telegraph operator handled 250 messages just from the passengers, and including all the navigational things that were meant to do, weather, navigational charts, discussion of where they were. The night of the accident, the USS Misawa sent a message to the operator at 11 o'clock at night. He took the message, put it underneath a paperweight, and went back to finishing all of his passenger messages, all his emails, all his texts, basically, and that message never got to the bridge. He was tied up in technology, communicating trivial things back and forth to people back home. A disaster. Um, I hear often from people, why are our young men so passive? Why is it that young men are so passive? If you talk to any teacher, they'll tell you this. The media has arranged the culture in such a way to trick their brains to think they've accomplished something when in fact they really have done nothing. For example, video games have overwhelmed the media. 70-inch monitors, 3D, 4K, surround sound. It gives kids a sense of accomplishing something as they go from level to level without ever really doing anything in this world. Nothing else quite matches the experience of a video game in the real world. Their brain has been tricked into believing they've accomplished
accomplish something when they really have never accomplished anything beyond just the game. Kind of sad reality of what media has done. Okay, venture, what can we do? What do we do now? Where do we go from here? We get it. Media is a wasteland of the toxic dumb. We're the dumbest nation. We're the dumbest group of people in the history of mankind. What can we do? A few good points I have. One is the branch is easily bent when it's tender. We have to guard our hearts, and it starts in our homes. It's always a subtle thing with media. It's indirect, and it persuades us very efficiently and effectively. Media is a tool that we need to be very cautious about. Whatever the brain does a lot of, the brain gets very, very good at. We have to learn, or two, we have to learn how to harness it and use it for ministry. This is what really the next two days are of the conference. How do we take this powerful tool and use it for ministry? How do we cut through the noise, take it away from ourselves, and point it to Christ? Um, number three is, what is our message? What really is our message to the world? We know it well enough, we articulate it well enough to what is our message to the world. It's time to put on the full armor of God. Paul said, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Thank you very much, you guys. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry I didn't get you a microphone that didn't work either. Here's another one. Let's do this one. I'm assuming you know how to put a microphone I on. I okay. Do. I've done it. Yes. <laughs> I can do this one. And I'm going to get rid of this throbbing logo. Sorry about that, everybody. I don't know how to work Keynote. Um, and you can watch me fumble through this. Let's see. Let's do that. How about that? Um, giving you a little bit of time to send in your questions. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do that, remember two methods, Twitter or uh, the app itself. So let me, uh, I'm just going to open up my, uh, both of those and see uh, as these questions come in, we can, uh, we can ask those of Steve. I have a few of my own to, to get us started. Um, how you told your mic? Good? I think it's okay. Yeah. Check, check. I think it's okay. okay. Yeah. Very good. Um, Steve, so first question I wanted to ask you was about uh, these two movies that uh, we've been enjoying, uh, these short films or whatever you call them, yeah. um, that, the, that the Senate has been using in so many different ways. Uh, uh, Road to Emmaus and Come Follow Me. What, what was the conversation like before those became um, reality? Where's, uh, A you know, was there... Great question. I think we began this conversation at the Senate building about 2005, and we were hearing from missionaries around the world that um, our synod and multi-language publication and NPH do a great job of printing content, but the sad reality is less than half of the world actually reads. But for some reason, they all have DVD players, and they seem to watch videos somehow and watch movies and films. So it became a project that was kind of born out of world missions. and. Um, we started kind of like deciding, we spent four years meeting and discussing what is the first film that we're gonna do, and Road to Emmaus was kind of hatched out of those meetings. And I think what was pleasantly surprising to us is that congregations felt the need as strongly as missionaries had a need for it. And it just has really, really blossomed. Um, it's been translated, I think, in nine different languages, something like that. It's been broadcast on 24, in 24 different countries. And um, I think we've distributed half a million DVDs around. And I've heard so many stories. Uh, it's kind of hard to always share stories, but we've heard in Nepal, literally a missionary will put it on the back of a donkey with a solar panel and a DVD player and go up in the mountains and will share it with villages in the mountains of the Nepal. And I just, you know, it's kind of amazing. It's been really a blessing to, to kind of see it being used. Uh, the second one was Come Follow Me, and My Son, My Savior is the third movie that'll come out this fall and be kind of targeted for Christmas and it's the story of Mary, and how Mary points us to Christ. So why Mary? Um, you know, looking at movies like Noah and uh, Exodus and all these that, that we're seeing in the theater. Anybody see Noah? <laughs> Anybody see Noah? Yeah, pretty bad, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> why not Samson, no. <laughs> Samson or Jonah or you know, uh, one of those uh, dramatic stories? Why, why Mary? You know, I, I, it was, we had a, um, a scriptwriter from Los Angeles, a woman that wrote the story for us. And we work with a, a team of pastors and scholars that work on it. And it just, we go through an incredible vetting process. And I think Mary was chosen because she is so beloved in many cultures and um, it explains who she is and what role she has and um, where her role kind of begins and ends and where Christ takes over. And I think that was, is that diplomatic enough? I'm always concerned about Ron Line here. Um, so um, it, it's, it, it's a great story. It's um, honestly, I'm just a cog in the wheel of this thing. And um, we shot it last, about three weeks ago. We finished a trailer for it two or three days ago, and I think you're the first audience that's gonna see the trailer for the movie tonight, I believe. It's all on Martin's shoulders, What's quite tonight? honestly. So, Let's see if we uh, yeah. can make that happen, all right? Bear with me just a second as we pull it up. Um, get the mics down. Have you guys, has anybody seen a Road to Emmaus or Come Follow Me? Has anybody seen it or used it in their congregations? Any thoughts about it or any, no, I'm not looking for that, but no, any, any like, um, you know, I guess as a lay person also, before we start this, my goal was to find something that could equip our people to walk to the backyard of your neighbor and hand it to your neighbor over the fence. And that was really partly my goal, I guess. And I think we always have a hard time Maybe we're challenged them starting a conversation. And literally, I have a box of 100 of these in my home. Every time the Mormons knock on my door or the Jehovah Witnesses, I always go, hey, I got something for you. I'll take your stuff if you take mine. And I always literally will have one sitting there and I'll hand it out, you know. And um, it, it really, to me, we've always kind of wanted a conversation starter and this will provide. I think at Christmas time too, it's a great time. Stocking stuffer, think of that. Think of your grandkids. Think of your, uh, you know, your family members that maybe that have you know, kind of falling away a little bit or, um, you know, so that's kind of the, the thought process with this project. And it's easy, I think, you know, it's kind of easy to hand off and say, hey, have you seen it? Let's talk about it. So that's the idea. I think I'm ready for the premiere. Okay, Are you sorry. guys ready? All oh, right. Oh, wow, when it dim lights too, great. It began with a visit from an angel sent by God. You are about to become pregnant and will give birth to a son. There's no room anywhere, Mary. It it's would... time. Uh, it's time. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord.
have to tell you, it's a lot easier watching a movie than it is actually making a movie. <laughs> it is a lot more challenging. I think the challenge for a movie like this is that I think we all have these scenes in our head. We all know what the nativity looks like to us. We know like what the crucifixion looks like. We've all heard the stories from little on. We kind of know these stories. The challenge I have is I have to get close to the way you imagine it to be. And that's always a challenge, I think. And it's hard on fixed budgets, too. What does a busy street of Jerusalem look like? And how do I get myself to be able to create that? So that's always the challenge. So, How, did, how was the casting done for Mary? That obviously a central figure. You know, not just anybody can play Mary. What were you looking for? Um, we cast in Los Angeles. We cast in Chicago. We cast in Milwaukee. We did Minneapolis. We went around the country. I think I saw 50 or 60 different Marys. And... Um, this one woman walked in, strong Christian woman, and she had the script completely memorized. And she sat there and did the entire scene and started crying in the middle of her rehearsal. And she was so moved by the content of the material. And it's just like you could literally see the Lord's hand like, this is the one. You know? And it was just like, thank you, Lord, because I am dumb and I can't figure out which one to choose. And that was the, that's literally how it came about. And um, we just knew she was perfect for the role. And um, just outstanding Christian woman, and um, um, you could see her every day just, in a sense, becoming Mary. So, yeah. And I think, you know, also, uh, we wanted someone that didn't look like a white German woman. We just didn't <laughs> want that look. And that's challenging sometimes, trying to find, you know, people that look ethnic. And Mary, you kind of like, she goes, I go to Mexico, and people think I'm Hispanic, and I go to India, and they think I'm Indian. So she's like kind of every woman in a way. So. Um, so that's some of the challenges. So when is it going to be available? Um, I, you guys are the first to see it, so um, beyond our office. Um, so the, um, the movie will be done by September, Lord willing, okay. and awesome. be available to congregations in the fall. So. All right, now we get a little dangerous, Steve. Uh, questions, we've got a lot of questions here from, uh, from the audience. First one from Ben Springer. He says, how do we take away the noise of media and point it to Christ? Uh, well, I think part of it was like we talked in, uh, earlier on that, you know, it starts at, at home. And I think it's just, it becomes a personal thing, I think. Um, don't you feel like it's something that you have to, in a sense, um, be responsible for your own content that you're absorbing in a way? It's easy to sit and watch Breaking Bad. And you kind of go like, oh, should I be watching this? Is this something that would be God-pleasing? I think that's something that you have to ask yourself, you know? When no one's watching or no one else is listening, what is your heart telling you? How can we as Christ servants train our young people's brains to focus on Christ using media? Wow, these are all like heavy handed. I'll tell you, <laughs> wow. You guys got any ideas? Anybody? This is the interactive part of the evening. I'm not going to just like, you know, I feel like, you know, like it's like Phil Donahue here. Um, that's an old reference. Uh, <laughs> some people get it, some don't. Phil who? Um, the. Um, um, what was the question again? How, Wait, somebody have anything? <laughs> How can we as Christ servants train our young people's brains to focus on Christ, focus on Christ using media? You know what? I, uh, last Easter, um, um, God is not dead. Anybody see that God is not dead? Um, I took my kids. We went to Easter service uh, on Sunday, and then we went to watch that movie as a family. And it was in the theater. Was that last year or a year before? And... Um, it was a great discussion. We went to dinner afterwards and just a great discussion about the movie. And I think, you know, in a sense, as parents, we, I think you try to find opportunities to, to start a conversation like this. And the movie allowed us to talk for an hour and a half afterwards at dinner about the movie. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it's, it's one example of things you can do. Sure. You, know, you know, I got something else there. Um, who, who gets a devotion, a daily devotion? What do, you, what do you get for a daily devotion? What do you get? The one from Wells, uh, my, my mailbox every morning. Okay, where, where do you live, sir? Right here in Washington. Okay, Any, uh, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Where do you, where do, where do you live? Okay, um, the question that I have, Martin, this is not aimed at you, but it's just a general question. Um, who sends that to you? You're, you're, you're 300 miles away, 200 miles away, right? Who sends it to you? In social media, it seems we want a one-to-one -one connection, right? So you have no idea who sent that to you. Why doesn't your pastor send you that every day? Why doesn't Wells write these 
and the pastor sent it to you, your pastor at your home congregation? Why does it come from the corporate headquarters, the plant that's Wells? Why doesn't it come from your pastor? It would be a simple touch every single day, and it probably could be electronically set up. Sorry, Martin. It can be set up electronically that it comes from your pastor. It's taking a nasty turn. Without, <laughs> but isn't that, a, I mean, you know, a lot of congregations that, you know, we're just overworked. What can we do? What can, how, can we, how can we handle this? And it seems like such an easy, and you know what? It would be a personal touch. It, you can go to your pastor on Sunday and say, hey, I got that Tuesday devotion that talked about this. That was great. I mean, it just seems like it would be such an easy touch. Yeah, go ahead. You had a question? Well, I'm saying, why doesn't the Wells give it to you to send out? We know the content's perfect. Your, your members are getting it, <laughs> right? So, no, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't expect you to sit down at 4 o'clock in the morning to write one, but why isn't electronic? You can be on vacation. It can be electronically set up for you to feed your members that. Just a thought, right? Steve, I was going to give you an easy question next, oh, now, but now, I, now. now I've changed my mind. <laughs> yeah, I know. Darn it. Well, the last ones weren't easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to give it to you anyway. How hard was it to find the cat in the, for the movie? The cat? The cat. Isn't there a cat in the trailer? No, I don't think there was that. I didn't see a cat. Oh, Did you guys see a then cat? it was cast. How hard was it to find the cast? <laughs> it says cat. <laughs> nice. Did you not see the cat in There's your own no movie? There's no cat. Oh. I'm not a cat person. Um, I'll, re I'll, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll rewrite it for the uh, yeah, author. How hard was it to find the cast for the movie? Yeah. Is that one of my kids? Um, <laughs> the, um, go back to school. Um, the, uh, we, look for, we want an entire Christian cast. That's really what our goal is. So we will only, we'll try to really um, find Christians to be the cast. Um, the hardest thing was to find baby Jesus. Try to talk a mom into, hey, we're going to take your baby that's brand new born and put it in a manger with a bunch of animals around it. You know, it's not really something a lot of moms are really excited about. But uh, we actually had three babies on set the day we did um, the nativity scene. Baby one came in. Baby one started crying. Baby one left. Baby two came in. Got the camera started. Baby two is crying. Baby three needs a diaper change. It was like literally like this. And, uh, and then the parents got wise to me and said, okay, which baby is going to be in the final version? And it's like, oh, now you're going to, yeah. So that's what we did on the final day. So uh, we spent probably four or five months casting, um, and I saw every actor. I met and auditioned everybody for the cast. So, and, you know, I think we started with Road to Emmaus, and our Bruce Marciano is the Jesus. He's from Los Angeles. He was in the Matthew series 15, 20 years ago. And um, that is probably the hardest role to play. And it's, it's interesting, Bruce is a really, really strong Christian man, and he will spend the entire day off in the corner by himself. He really won't talk to anybody, not because he's standoffish, because he takes the role so serious. And he comes in and does it, and it's just, we've handpicked the crew and cast, and it's just kind of really a magical moment when we're shooting this. One quick story from the, scene, from, uh, from the movie. We were shooting the crucifixion scene one day, and it's like, you know, it's, you can just see God's hand throughout this thing, that stormy, nasty, rainy, cloudy, overcast day. And it's like, all right, it's Good Friday. I mean, you just had that sense. And the uh, DP, the director of photography, was looking in the viewfinder. Not a Wells guy. I think he's a Christian, not really sure. And he put, pulled his eye away and said, I can't look at what they have done to this man. I just can't bear to look in the viewfinder to see the shot of him on the cross. And you kind of think, okay, ministry is beginning right here on the set and with our crew and with our cast, and it's going out to the world. So, um, yeah, it's a great privilege. It really is to be able to do these. So, You mentioned your daughter before. She did actually ask a question. Did she really? Okay. Yeah. My daughter you works, already answered it. My, so daughter works, my daughter works in Los Angeles. All so, right. Um, she said In hi. the media. <laughs> She's in the media, by the way, too. So we're, we're training young Christians to work in the media. Awesome. So that's, that's outstanding. She said, hi, Dad. How, do you, how did you pick Mary? This is a serious question. You never told me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've already answered. Sorry, Cass. Right. Uh, now you know. Yeah. So um, uh, James Karlofsky said, Karlofsky said, I noticed the disciples from the road to Emmaus in this trailer. Very good. Wow. Do many yeah. actors from previous movies also make an appearance? Yes. The, yes, we keep our disciples in check. 
all the disciples that were in uh, Come Follow Me and Road to Emmaus are in this one, and I keep them all straight. But I'll tell you, it becomes a, um, a challenge when you're filming these. I remember the, we were doing, I think it was Come Follow Me, and we're at the, um, at the um, Last Supper. And literally at some point I'm thinking, okay, who was on Jesus' left and right? And then who was next to them? And, it, you know, and it's like, all of a sudden it becomes kind of like a, uh, you know, you got to get this right. You know, you got to get this really right. So I'm calling the seminary, trying to get some profs out of class and asking them. <laughs> and it's like, okay, when do you cover your head and when don't you cover your head as a Jewish, you know? So, I'm, yeah, so we really painstakingly try to be very, very accurate with this. And we believe every detail is thought of, but trust me, there's probably a mistake somewhere. And also in this movie, which is kind of ironic, again, it's the Lord's hand thing. Um, did you see the little white lamb in the manger scene? Did you see that? Um, um, it came from a, 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 a local farm and uh, uh, the shepherds. And the amazing thing is every time we were kind of looking, this white lamb was so noticeable. It's downtown Jerusalem. It's in this scene. And somehow, like, all of a sudden, it's kind of a, the Lord gave us this little theme and this little weave of the fabric of the movie that it's the lamb of God. And um, he's even looking into the, you know, so it was just kind of like a quirky theme, I guess, in my head. Okay, so that's just what I was thinking. So... Another question, what are some of the unique challenges and opportunities of using movies to share the gospel? I mean, that's kind of the business that, that we're in here, but uh, what are some challenges and opportunities to, to doing that through movie? Um, you know, the stories I hear from our missionaries is something that really, I guess, warms my heart. I've, I've heard from missionaries in Mexico that have used it in churches, and they send photographs back, and they're projecting on the wall in a church in Mexico. And when I see those kind of stories, it's, uh, it's really moving. I think there was a church in Montana. I could be wrong, but I know it was somewhere in the Rocky Mountains that ordered Road to Emmaus, 1,400 copies of Road to Emmaus to this congregation that was between pastors. They were looking for a pastor, and I think they were still going through the calling process or something happened, and I called up the congregation. I said, hey, I just want to make sure this order is correct. 1,400 DVDs. That's more houses than you have in this city in Montana. And they're like, yeah, we're going to go door to door, and everybody in town is getting one of these. You don't have a pastor yet? No, we're still looking for a pastor, but we're so motivated as a congregation that we are going to hand these things out door to door. And I thought, wow. I mean, that's, that's a great, powerful story. And I'll tell you, we hear from people in um, Australia, from New Zealand, around the globe that some have heard about this, and we ship them DVDs around the globe. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like a little seed. It's really enjoyable to be involved in. Another question. With the crucifixion scene in My Son, My Savior, is this appropriate for a young audience? Great question. We debated this thoroughly. And um, at some point, you learn this in Sunday school. At some point, this is the reality of, of what happened to Jesus. And we discussed it thoroughly about how much do you sugarcoat this, how much do you show this actually the way it is. And I guess we decided it's certainly up to families to do what they feel is right. And at some age, this is not appropriate. I totally get that. But I think at some point, it's accurate. And um, that was kind of the decision that we made. So, um, And Come Follow Me, we were very probably a little more careful not to show too much graphic content. This one, a little more um, real, I guess I should say. So, um, but it, trust me, it is, it's very carefully discussed and vetted. So, are you considering making a little similar question? Are you considering making movies like Road to Emmaus or Come Follow Me made more for children? Um, that's a great question. Um, right now, I know there's one more movie planned in this series, and it's called uh, It's going to be The Journey of Paul, and um, it, it, that's the next one planned in this series. And we're also involved in another project um, in Los Angeles. Bruce Marciano is. Um, is a it's, a, it's a story of, it's a pro-life story, and Bruce is a janitor in an abortion clinic and talks to young women in the waiting room. And it's really a moving story that just got wrapped up, and it's kind of, um, uh, it's a modern day story with a Jesus-type character in the uh, waiting room helping young women make a decision. And it's a really moving piece. So um, right now, we don't have things planned for grade school that much other than Kids Connection, which is a fine tool. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know if you know the answer to this one, because uh, I don't. Are these productions centered financially? Or is it possible to continue these you know, with the You know, I knew that question funds. would come up. It's always, uh, let me cut through the core of this. The, 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 the question is, who pays for this? How much money is it? And does it, is it worth it? That's kind of the question. It's a great question. Um, I'll tell you, Wells Connection was, let me go back a little bit. Wells Connection was started on the platform. I met with President Mischke about Wells Connection 28 years ago, and it was started on the platform of subscription-based, that if congregations see it's valuable and see it's a worthwhile tool, they will subscribe to it. If it isn't, they won't, and it's over with. So Wells Connection is actually subscription-based purely, and that's how it is funded. If it's not of value and it's not worth it, it won't get done. Kids Connection is on that same platform, subscription-based. So, and the movie is also the same system, that it is, in a sense, the broadcast rights that are sold comes back to the Synod, that money that really self-funds these projects. And the sale of DVDs, all that comes back to the Synod. So it is a, I am first off probably, or I come out of the business world, that's where I live and that's where I make my living. So we really try to set these things up that they are um, positive and they are blessed in their usage. So Wells Connection, Kids Connection, the movies are all kind of set up in these same platforms. Does that help? You guys have any, you guys have any questions? I mean, let's. These people online are good, but any questions? Oh, these are people. In the oh, room. these are everybody. Okay, everybody's, okay. We don't want them to talk. You know, this no. <laughs> I want to really don't want I want to talk. single out the people that I know that are kind of, I want to know who's asking these questions. So I, want to see, I want to see the white of their eyes. I have a question. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing or planning on doing for the Luther's Reformation? Um, yes, I can. Um, uh, 500th anniversary, yep. anybody know what it is? 2017. Very good. Just checking. Just seeing if you guys are awake. 2017, October 2017. Um, we were asked to be um, involved in a in, in in a film on Martin Luther. Um, it will be a two-hour film. Um, NPH really, God bless NPH. They started the conversation. John Brown there. It started the conversation probably three years ago with us. Kept whispering in my ear, Steve. Five years from now, you know, six years. He always kept whispering, "You're gonna do it. We gotta do something." So we are working uh, through John and NPH. Thriven is also involved. The other synods are involved. And we are producing a two hour long film on the anniversary of the Reformation, 2017, October 2017. It will be, Lord willing, broadcast on national PBS. And we are also working closely with the BBC on this program as well. And we have already done 20 or, it'll be kind of a docudrama in the sense that we've done, a, we've done about 20 or 30 interviews and we've already written the script and it's gone to NPH for their review and critique. So that's where it's at right now. So we are well on our way to produce the film. One. Yeah. <laughs> well. need. So. It's exciting. It's really been really kind of interesting to kind of be involved in, yeah, in this project. So uh, my colleague, Mike Trinkline, we pulled him out of our day-to-day -day work, and he's been working on this thing for about two years, researching, doing interviews. And we've interviewed a cross-section of people from the Lutheran world. We've interviewed numerous Catholics for this project. We're trying to get an interview with Cardinal Dolan for, the, the, for this project. We've gone around the globe interviewing people about this project. It's fascinating. One final question. Um, a lot of the people in this room are, could be influential in starting some kind of media ministry in their own congregations, better use of media. What kind of things could they do? Uh, how would you encourage them to, to uh, get, a, get a start? You know, I brought some stats. Um, how is your congregational website? You guys, how are, you, are you happy with the websites you guys have for your congregation? Yeah, yeah that's great. That's awesome. It's really a front door today, isn't it? To, to uh, you know, I, I've talked to several, um, pastors and several teachers that are apprehensive to put their email addresses on the website. You've, we've seen in the past where these kind of forms are, please fill out this form if you want to contact us. And I think that day is over with. And I think we all get spam. We all understand spam is kind of a pain. We get that. But in this world, I think 
when I visit a school and want to talk to a third grade teacher, I should be able to find her email address really quickly. So um, I also know that there are great gifted young people that are very media and video savvy. I think the stat is, I think I saw a stat that a website is more likely to come up by um, 53 times more likely to find a website if video is on this website. Um, incorporating video into your email marketing increases clicks through by 96%. 59% um, of the audience would rather watch a video instead of reading text. So that's amazing to think about that. So um, I think as much as you can incorporate video and people have a chance to meet the congregation maybe by video first before they walk through the front door is always kind of a great opportunity. So I know a lot of, there's so many young people that are just so really gifted and camera equipment and all the expense of doing it has really come down greatly. So, true? Yeah, good. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Steve, I think we're at the end of our hour on, on behalf of the Synod and uh, hopefully everybody in this room, I think we're, we're really grateful that uh, that we count you among our ranks. Uh, we need a Steve Betcher. Thank you no, very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Steve. Thanks, brother.